is Chris Beasy, and I am one of the partners at Armanino. I'm a tax partner, uh, and I lead the Denver the Denver Armanino office. And with me today, I have Sherry Luther, who is the CFO of Lattice Semiconductors, and uh, very excited to have her with us. Um, we've gotten to know each other quite well over the past few weeks, and uh, I think we're going to have a very, very interesting conversation today. So I wanted to just start off with maybe just having you, Sherry, give a little bit of background kind of on who you are and kind of where you came from. Maybe tell us a little bit about your journey from, um, from you know, where you grew up to where you are. And um, let's, let's just start off by, you know, telling us a little bit about uh, where you came from in terms of work and everything. Let's start there. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll start current and go back. How's that? Perfect. So um, currently I'm the CFO at Lattice Semiconductor, uh, going on two and a half, three years now. Um, certainly a, a really fun journey so far and, and uh, love to, to talk about some of the great progress that we've made there and improving uh, the financials of the company and really um, forming, getting that transformation uh, underway. Um, but prior to Lattice, I was at Coherent. Uh, I was there for about 16 years. Um, had a number of roles, wore, wore lots of different hats in that 16 years, which, which is why I stayed so long, because it was, it was fun, had a, had a lot of uh, really great opportunities uh, to pursue uh, during that time frame. did a lot of M&A, um, I was uh, in Germany for two years as an expat, that was really fun, um, so great, great experiences there. Um, before that, I was at Quantum, a uh, disk drive company, um, as, as many of you probably know, that, that industry has undergone quite a bit of consolidation. Um, but was there for 10 years, um, a lot of great of, of experiences there. And uh, prior to that, at, at, at a small startup, and then uh, really started my career at Arthur Anderson in public accounting uh, on, on the audit side. Um, went to college in Ohio, uh, a small town in Ohio, went to Wright State University. Um, and uh, after, after graduating from Wright State, decided I wanted to, to, to get into high tech. I thought that would be exciting, an exciting place to to start my career and uh, move to the to the Bay Area to Silicon Valley to, to start my career here. Cool. Um, well, let's let's talk a little bit about your kind of where you came from and everything. It's I feel like that's a really uh, interesting background for uh, what you just said was a really good background of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but that story starts uh, early on in Ohio, and uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. Uh, a lot of people that influenced you and everything. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about I don't know what what was it that made you want to be a CFO and 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 I guess part of that is I mean where you came from you, you probably didn't have a ton of exposure to folks like that but maybe tell us a little bit about your hometown and everything too. Yeah, sure. So so I grew up in a suburb of Dayton, Ohio. And um, as I said, went, went to Wright State University there. Um, the university certainly has grown uh, since, I, since I graduated. Um, it was much smaller at the time I went there. Um, I think what really got me interested in, in accounting and finance was um, my auditing teacher at that time. And, and uh, she actually had experience uh, working at Arthur Anderson, coincidentally. And so my auditing class, as strange as it sounds, I actually liked it. I, I liked my auditing class. No, it's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that that really kind of piqued my interest in auditing, um, and then um, you know, and it, just in terms of you know what made me want to you know progress further on, and and really focus in my career, um, someone who was a really big influence uh, on me was my dad. Uh, my dad was a, a deputy chief of police in, in Dayton, Ohio, and he, um, you know, I really saw his work ethic and. You know, when he joined the police department, um, he, he didn't have his college degree at that time, uh, but he knew that in order to move up, he would need to get his college degree. And so while working on the police department, he, he got his, his undergraduate degree and then um, later pursued higher studies as well. But I saw him, you know, working a full-time job, multiple, you know, different shifts, as you can imagine, on the police department, and then, um, you know, studying uh, for his college courses. And so that really had an impact on me where, you know, it really sort of reinforced um, my desire to, to work hard and really, you know, strive to, to do, to, to accomplish more in life. 
um, even if it means you have to work really, really hard. And so that that's kind of the, the work ethic. I think I got it from my dad, um, just really wanting to work hard and and push push forward to 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 you know succeed into higher things. Cool. Um, so my next question is actually one of my favorite questions um, because this kind of shows how human you are uh, and how how we can kind of relate ourselves to it because uh, when I was a kid, uh, my first job was dressing up as Grimace for McDonald's. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's one of my more favorite favorite things. But um, you had a very similar experience. Maybe you weren't grimace, but uh, you 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 had you had a couple of things that you did uh, that I think are very valuable because you know you learned a lot of different lessons in it. Maybe tell me a little bit about your first couple of jobs, so I won't be the only one who's embarrassed. <laughs> I worked at. Um... One of my first jobs when I was uh, in uh, later in my high school years and uh, into college was at Wendy's, Wendy's Hamburgers uh, in, in the Dayton area. And I remember, um, you know, definitely working in those types of jobs. It's hard work, you know, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a cakewalk. It's definitely no. hard work. And, you know, you, I, I, I would come home smelling like a hamburger because, you know, because you're, you're, that's what you're doing, right? You're grilling hamburgers. And uh, one of my jobs was cleaning the salad bar, which was uh, kind of a pain. You realize how sloppy people are when you have to clean up after them. So, so, so when I would go to the salad bar at any restaurant, I would certainly try to be careful because I knew how messy, uh, what, a, what a messy job it is to clean up. But I worked at Wendy's and I also worked at Domino's Pizza. And that was, uh, that was a crazy time. I think I started as a, as a hostess, so I would seat people. And then when it got really busy, then I would take their order. and. You know, and and on a on a busy evening, you know, I can definitely recall times when, uh, you know, the orders didn't come out as fast as people wanted them to, and so you'd have to, you know, give them a free pizza or, you know, somehow make them happy as a, you know from a customer service perspective, um, and so that was that was really crazy. That that was a, a a hard job, and you know, you 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 learn from that not only working hard but the value of people, right? Because those kinds of jobs typically have a lot of turnover. Um, and so, you know, it's hard for, for management there to, to manage people because it's just constantly, you know, the doors, you know, uh, constantly turning uh, with new people. But I think those are great experiences to have. I think, as you mentioned, Chris, from your McDonald's experience, you learn a lot. You learn a lot when you have uh, when you work in those types of jobs. Sure do. I sweat a lot, but that was, that was my costume. So, um, so. One of, one of the things that uh, I thought was really cool was, I mean, Lattice Semiconductors is one of the premier semiconductor builders of, of the, the modern world. And, um, you know, you came, uh, came from a smaller, uh, smaller town growing up to one of the largest semiconductor producers in, in the world, really. And, I mean, what, what possessed you to, you know, do this? What, what made you look in the mirror and say, I can do this. Cause I think that's one of the things that you and I have definitely covered several times is that you have to be able to believe in yourself. Uh, and it seems like you believed in yourself very, very early on. How did you, how did you kind of, how did you get there? I think that's a really interesting message here. If, uh, if you might touch on that a moment. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, I think a, a part of it is just being curious, wanting to learn more and develop yourself more um, to, to take on more uh, responsibility. Um, I, I can remember early in my career, you know, I, I, I can remember where, um, you know, I would, you know, seek to get promoted to the next level. And I think one of the companies that I worked, worked at um, earlier on, you know, they modified their promotion policy, right? Because it was sort of like, you need to be in a job longer than that before you get promoted. You know, you need to be in a job longer than six months or a year to get promoted to the next level. And um, I, I, I only mentioned that because it was really my, my drive to take on more responsibility um, because I was curious as to how I could have an impact in a lot of different areas. Um, and so that was, that was very appealing to me and, and very exciting as I would take on more responsibility. And, 
I think, you know, even if you, it doesn't have to mean a promotion, right? You don't need to get promoted to take on more responsibility. You can just be curious and ask for, you know, additional responsibilities or exposure into different areas so that you can understand how they work in a company, how different functions work. Um, you know, an example is M&A. At, 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 when I was at Coherent, the company was very acquisitive. I, I think while I was there, we acquired over 20 different companies that actually closed um, and, and the hit rate's pretty low. So you look at a whole lot more companies than you actually, than deals that you consummate. But, you know, it's just wanting to say, hey, can I help in this area? Can I, can I have exposure here? Um, and whether it just becomes a, you know, sort of a one-time project that you get to learn from or whether it evolves into other things where you can take on more responsibility and take on greater roles, either way you benefit. Um, so I think it's that, that just really curiosity and drive to, to want to learn more and develop myself more and have, so I can have an impact. Great. Um, that might be a really good segue to this question. Um, what do you think one really interesting thing is that you might have learned along the way that you can utilize to get you to the next level? You know, one thing it, it, it sounds so, may sound so obvious, but it's not really. Um, you need to let people know what you want to do, right? What exposure, what areas you want to be exposed to. And maybe even before that, um, talk to people who are in roles that you think you would like to, to take on at some point in the future. Um, not only does that give you the opportunity to understand what those roles are like and say, yeah, I would like to do that, or maybe not, maybe that's not exactly what I thought it was, um, but it also shows you how other people kind of think about things and, and how they got to where they, you know, the role that they, they got into or, or, or you know, achieved. Um, you make great relationships there through me meeting people, talking to people, asking them about their journey. Um, then they introduce you to other people that gives you other insights and in the aspects of other roles um, that, that just helps widen your horizons. And, and so when I say that, you know, it might, might seem simple or might seem obvious, I, 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 and people that I've talked to, not, not a lot of people necessarily do that, right? Um, you, you, can have, you can have people who are really strong performers and do, excellent and do an excellent job, but that doesn't mean that we all know what they want to do, right? Um, and, you know, every, every single person on this call um, can be a stellar performer, but what, what are the next steps that they want to take in their career? What exposures do they want to have in other areas? Everybody's going to be different. Not everybody's the same, right? And so I think it's, you know, uh, being, being uh, curious and meeting people and asking about their journey and also being very open and saying, hey, you know, I'd like to have some exposure to this area. Can I have exposure to that area? How can I get exposure? Um, look at your current company, look at, you know, the current areas in your company. Can I help in this certain area? It doesn't mean your job title changes. It doesn't mean your role changes. Just ask for exposure into that area. Maybe it's something that you, um, you know, decide that you'd like to do and you would like to, you know, help sort of go that path in your career. Um, it, it, it exposes other people to your abilities. Um, and, and so it's a simple thing that, that can really open the, open the door for a lot of different things, I think. And that, that's something that um, I, I certainly learned and I, I don't think a lot of people necessarily think about it that way. Cool. Um, I, think, I think one of the really interesting things about you is that uh, in 2019, no, 2020, you were named uh, public CFO of the year by Portland News Journal or Business Journal. Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you know it 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 wasn't it wasn't about technology. It wasn't about anything. It was that you were the public CFO of the year. And um, I think one of the really interesting questions uh, some people might have is as a female and as a female. For a CFO, um, sorry, I don't know if you heard my phone ringing there. Uh, technology, um, uh, as as a CFO of a publicly traded company, company and being a female, have you have you ever gone through any issues? You know that might have uh, impeded your ability to make it to where you're at today. You know, I have to say, I, I think I've been very fortunate where I, I don't think I've had any experiences, you know, negative experiences um, that unfortunately a lot of people have had. Um, and and that's, that's not a good thing, right, um, for those to happen. But I've been very fortunate and have not had anything. 
Um, I, I've had great mentors, uh, both male and female, who've been very, very supportive and have really helped um, give me perspective as, as I've moved throughout my career. And so I'm, I'm extremely thankful for that. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's an area, obviously, of great concern for because a number of people have had, you know, issues occur, which are which are not not good, certainly not a good thing. So do you think maybe that has to do with kind of the mentor mentee kind of relationship? Um, I mean, I think that's one of your very big things is to make certain that you're aligned well with with mentors and what have you. Um, you know, those are going to be people that put you under their wing and, and take you along for opportunities and experiences. Um, do you think that because you chose the right kind of mentors, that might be the case? Because, uh, you know, I, I, I've definitely heard where there's been the opposite um, side of that story with, you know, respect to being a female in, in the workforce, but do you, do you think that you might be able to circumvent some of that with maybe some of the uh, mentor-mentee relationships that you can, uh, you can possibly get involved in? You know, I, I, I don't know if that would, would prevent it because I think, you know, the, the issues, um, you know, sort of the Me Too, Me Too movement and all of that. I mean, those kinds of issues uh, arise in different ways, right? I, I don't know if the, the mentor mentee relationship would, would solve all of those for sure. Um, but what I can say is that, um, you know, I definitely encourage people to, um, you know, look for mentors in, in different areas, right? Your boss can be your mentor, you know, peers at your company uh, or just in your network can be your mentors. Um, I, I think they come in, in different ways and it's through actively seeking out and talking to people who want to be people who are are in positions that you um, you know are striving to be in that will help you meet others who can help mentor you and it's not it's not one-stop shopping I think where you know you sort of have one person who helps you in all areas uh, mentor related right um, you know there there's different aspects because like in my job I mean as, as CFO um, you know, not only am I responsible for finance, I'm responsible for investor relations, I'm responsible for IT uh, and facilities and, you know, just overall operational management, you can have mentors help you with it. So it doesn't have to be in one, any, you're not, you know, you may not find one person who, who has all aspects that they can help you in, in mentoring. Uh, and so I would, I would seek out um, a, a various avenues so that you can really um, find areas where, you know, you can have someone who can guide you um, in, in, in many different aspects of your career. But I, I think, you know, finding a mentor is very important and it, it doesn't have to be something where it's official, right? You know, I'm looking for a mentor. Will you be my mentor? It doesn't have to be official. It's just uh, establishing relationships with people um, that you feel comfortable with and um, you can ask for guidance uh, on, on any number of issues, right? Just, just to help get their perspective and um, as, as you look at your career going forward. Right. So I, I am correct in, in saying that probably one of the biggest parts of kind of getting to where you are today is that kind of mentor relationship. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. mean, you had, so you recently had Jack Lazar uh, on, on your, uh, you know, did a, did a talk, he did a talk with you guys um, as well. And he's somebody that I met um, you know, in, in, in the way that I described, right, where um, met, met through um, people that I know, friends I know, actually a, a good friend of mine introduced me to Jack. Um, and the question I asked that good friend was, um, who, who happens to be a, a, a VC at, at um, one, one of the, a, a partner at one of the VC firms in the area. And the question I asked him was, um, you know, I'd love to meet um, the best CFO that you have on one of your boards. You know, whoever you consider to be the best CFO, I'd love to meet that person because I'm, you know, at that time I'm aspiring to be a CFO. Um, I also love to get on a board. So at some point, so, you know, that combination is perfect. And I'd love to meet that person because I'd like to, I'd like to understand what their qualities are and how they think about things and what their journey was. So that's an example of, of, of just what I was talking about. So you're advocating for yourself. That's, it's, it's. <laughs> That's what I hear. No, I'm kidding. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to I'm going to go kind of down the, uh, the, the the questions of kind of your company first, but uh, or, or next. But 
Do you have kind of any advice that you might want to give anyone kind of on this more personal side of things for you? I mean, I know that that's not what this is all about, but before we move to the next, uh, the next piece here, is there anything out there that you might be able to give to everyone, a little nugget or something? Yeah, I mean, in addition to the, you know, the, what we just talked about in terms of mentoring, um, the other thing I would say is that uh, one piece of, of great advice I, I got um, from another CFO um, that I think very highly of, she told me that if you want to be a CFO, then look in the mirror and tell yourself that you are a CFO and act like one. <laughs> so, you know, whether it's CFO or whether it's some other title, right, whatever you want to be, you, you know, tell yourself that you are that, that role and act like you are in that role, you know, in terms of, you know, the kinds of questions that you ask in your, in your regular job, how you think about things strategically. Um, I thought that was a really great piece of advice. So it's same, same thing. I mean, it could go apply for any, if you wanted to be a banker, you could. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Perfect. I love it. <laughs> are you thinking uh, of changing your career, Chris? <laughs> I, I might after this interview. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we spent a little bit of time on you. And I mean, I, I, I did have one follow up question for you. So your dad is the chief of police or the deputy director of police. Did you um, ever go for a ride in his car? Not for fun? Well, um, <laughs> you don't have to answer that. This is being recorded. I just thought I'd throw that at you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want my dad to get in trouble. I mean, he's not currently the deputy chief of police. That was many years ago. But yeah, there were some scary, uh, I, I had some scary uh, instances where it just happened to be in the car when something uh, when, when, when something happened. Um, and of course, you know, when, you, when you're a policeman, you're always on, right? You always have to be available if there's something going on. So I had some scary, some scary moments. Uh, but fortunately, all, all, all went well. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. All right. So uh, I'm going to switch it a little bit. We're going to go to the company itself. And we're going to talk a little bit about what you do there, how you do it. Uh, you've alluded to some of the stuff. But tell us about, tell us about Lattice and, and, and what you guys do there. I mean, I know you've got tons of different products. We're probably using them right now. Um, but tell us about some of the cool products you have, some of the things that you do, and um, tell us maybe some of the stuff that you are responsible for and how you go through that. Yeah, sure. So, so Lattice is the low power programmable leader for FPGAs. And an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. It's basically a chip. Um, and what, what differentiates Lattice is the small size of the chip and the fact that it is power optimized. So it has to not to suck up so much power uh, in an application. Um, that's one of the things the customers love about our product is if you think about an application, um, you, the last thing you want to do is have the, the chip consuming so much power that it, it impacts the ability of the product to operate effectively. So um, low power, uh, small size is what helps differentiate us, as well as the fact that an FPGA by design is, is self-programmable. So customers like it that as their needs change, they can program the chip. Um, they can change you know, the functionality of the chip as their needs change, um, unlike some other uh, types of applications um, which are not programmable. So those are a couple of the, the key things that help differentiate our products um, and make our customers like what we, what we provide to them. And we're constantly investing to continue to uh, optimize uh, power and performance for our customers. Um, so we're about, from, from a revenue perspective, historically, you know, we're about 400 million ish size in revenue. Um, our market cap has gone up significantly over the past few years uh, that I've been with the company. I think when I joined, it was about 700 uh, million in uh, market cap. Uh, now, depending on the day, it's about 7 billion. So um, huge improvement. Uh, why? Why has it improved so much? Well, um, when, when I joined a couple of years ago, uh, it was about the same time, uh, just prior to that, we had got a new CEO, Jim Anderson, joined the company, replaced the entire leadership team. And um, we basically have been transforming the company. And one of the, one of the first things that I did when I started um, was I put key metrics in place to manage the business. I mean, my, my, my motto is what, what gets measured gets done. 
Um, and that's um, when you look at our results over the past few years, it's, it's really a testament to that. Um, we've been increased our gross margin, you know, 450 basis points um, from 2018 to our most recent quarter. Um, we've uh, uh, our, our uh, operating expenses um, within that envelope of OPEX, we've been able to significantly reduce our SGNA spending while continuing to invest in R&D, uh, invest in the product portfolio and long-term roadmap of the business. Um, that's a key area of focus. We wanna continue investing uh, in, in, in our roadmap for the long-term growth. So that, that is a, a big area of focus. Um, we've significantly increased the, uh, the pace of product introductions and launches, um, uh, which is great for our customers because they tell us we love your products. We just want more of what you, more of your products. So, so we've significantly improved the landscape there. The other thing that we've done um, is significantly improve the, the leverage profile of the balance sheet. Uh, when I joined the company, the, the debt leverage was uh, over 5x. Uh, and then, uh, and very expensive debt. The interest rate was over 7%. Um, it's very expensive. And um, in our most recent quarter, our leverage ratio was down to 1.3. Um, and we're at the lowest interest rate tier, which is somewhere around one and a half percent. So um, really, really a huge improvement by, by refinancing the debt shortly after I joined in, in record time. I think Wells Fargo Bank said that they hadn't uh, done a refinance uh, like ours in, in that short a period of time ever. Um, so that was uh, something that was really important to me to, to act on quickly. Um, and get the set debt service costs down. So, so we have significantly improved that uh, profile of the balance sheet from a leverage perspective. Um, we are net cash positive. So cash generation has been a key area of focus for the company, looking at our working capital, improving that. Um, uh, we've, uh, 2020 was the, the first uh, time we were net cash positive in six years. So that's, that was a huge, uh, huge improvement there. Um, two quarters now of increasing that in the net positive cash position. So we've significantly transferred the company. Hence, you know, the higher, uh, you know, higher market cap, our investors really like the fact that we do what we say we're going to do. Um, uh, you really have established, uh, you know, that, that sort of um, predictability with our investors. Um, uh, they really um, value, uh, you know, the way that we're managing the business. So it's, it's been really a, a great transformation, but there's more, more to come. Definitely more to come, more to work on. Now, you've also experienced some pretty, pretty significant growth after the past couple of queues and, and what have you. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Probably a little bit. I don't know. I, I know you don't like talking about yourself and stuff like that, but I think that this is a really cool story about yeah, how yeah. Well, people can be. It's actually where it's really exciting because one of the things I noticed when I, you know, did my due diligence on the company was, I mean, the company had just been stagnating and had not been growing at all. It was just, you know, sort of, you know, call it a hundred million a quarter, you know, for so, you know, so many years back, right? Um, well, the past two quarters, we've been able to generate double digit uh, revenue growth in our, in our two key market segments of comms and compute and industrial and automotive. So, um, significant improvement there. In our most recent quarter, our, our comms and compute market segment grew 28%, our industrial and automotive grew 20%. Um, really pleased with those results. And, and, you know, what's driving them? Well, you know, a key part of that is, is this faster pace of, of uh, product introductions, um, for sure, is, is, is sort of under, underlying that. Um, but, but one of the, the things that we did early on in developing our strategy was identify key growth vectors for the company, um, in, in uh, comms and compute, it's servers, um, it's client computing, uh, it's 5G and communications and industrial and automotive, um, a huge, especially during COVID, a huge focus on hands-free and, um, you know, factory automation, um, are, uh, um, as well as the, you know, you look at robots and factories um, as well, a lot of areas like that have really grown. And then, of course, automotive can, continues to be a growth factor. And, and sort of then underneath all of that, you've got our, our new product introductions, uh, the launches that we, we have done, um, you know, three times the pace that the company previously had done. So um, not, a, not uh, only one growth factor, right, driver, um, multiple growth drivers um, that we're focused on with our products. So I think it's an interesting question then. So you, you, you see kind of the story of where a company was somewhat flat there for a while, but all of a sudden there's kind of this infused 
opportunity maybe is what it is. And, you know, I think a, a, a lot of times when you look at different uh, companies, you always are looking to what the, you know, what did the CEO do? Well, I don't know. I mean, I feel like in your position, I mean, I've said this to you before, but I feel like you, you, you know, you're in a really strange position because the CFO can't go to a CEO and say, hey, I don't know the answer to that. And you can't really go down to your people and say, hey, don't really know the answer to that. How do you, um, how do you go about changing everything the way that you did and, and still get, maintain the confidence that you're going to get to where you, where you need to go? Yeah, I know that's a good question because, you know, when you, I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, they, the entire leadership team was new. So when, so when Jim Anderson started, he brought on a new leadership team. Um, so in some respects that, that might make it easier, right? It's not just one person who's new who has to sort of change everyone else. Um, but you still have the entire company, you know, 750 employees, you know, who had a different leadership, right? So, so you need to get them over to, to your way of, you know, to our way of thinking, to my way of thinking, um, you know, to drive those results. And I think it's, it's really, um, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, you need to make sure that, first of all, you've got the right people in the right seat. Um, it's just like in, in that book, Good to Great, you know, that, you know, you need to have the right people uh, on the bus and in the right seat. Um, that's very important. And so, um, you know, I, that, that's something I spent a lot of time on, making sure I had the right people in the right position. I, uh, I got a new corporate controller, um, brought her on board. She's doing a great job. Uh, we got a you know director of FPNA who's he's doing he's doing a fabulous job. Um, got a, a, a CIO who, who's doing amazing amazing jobs. So I got you know a head of uh, investor relations. Got all you know got the right people in the right place. Um, people who are focused on driving change, driving an impact. Um, and and we're all like minded in that way and and very focused on doing that. And I think that's first and foremost. And then. You know, then you have to look and, and, and say, okay, you know, what are the what are our goals and objectives, right? Obviously, what's our strategy? What, what are our goals and objectives that lead us to that strategy? Um, and, and the one example that I've used before, which which is really true, um, you know, shortly after joining uh, the company, probably like on day two or something, you know, very early on, um, I was asking about, you know, what are some of the the goals and metrics, um, you know, for DSO, for example. Um, and when I asked that question, I, you know, the answer I got was, oh, you know, it's, I think at that time it was probably 80, it was upwards of 80 days. It was really high. Um, and so I asked what the goal was, and I think I got told something like 50 or 60. And I said, okay, well, never mind whether that's the right goal. How are you going to get there? Because you're really a lot higher than that right now. So what's your plan to get there? Um, and, and the answer I got was, well, we just think we can, we'll, we'll get there. We just think we can get there. I'm like, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? You just think you're going to get there. You need to have a plan because clearly you haven't gotten there yet. So how are you going to get there? Um, and so that was a very common theme where, you know, people had an idea where they thought in some cases, some cases not, but where they thought they had an idea, they didn't have a plan. And so you really have to, um, you know, establish that kind of culture and, and, and enforce that kind of rigor and discipline to have folks develop a plan. How are you going to get there? Um, once we achieve that goal, then let's look at the next goal. We just had our investor day a couple of weeks ago and we raised our long-term targets for the company. Um, we raised them because we achieved the, the goals that we put, put out two years ago. So um, it's that discipline and rigor of holding people accountable um, to goals and plans. Um, that was not the case previously. Um, could be another example of, well, you know, gosh, I would think everybody must have a goal and a plan. Well, no, that's not the case. It's definitely not the case here, here at Lattice. And so um, that rigor, that discipline, um, having that overall strategy where, where all of the goals met, fed, and, you know, fed into it is what allowed us to accomplish what we've accomplished uh, today. And that will help us accomplish further what our longer term goals are, are out there. So it's, it's a lot of things. I, I gave you a lot of stuff, I think, in that answer. But you, know, you got to have people, the right people, and you got to have the right um, uh, approach to establishing goals and holding people accountable to those goals. Cool. Well, I have a, I have a few, uh, a few questions here, so I'm going to get to them, but I do have one, one quick question for you. you. You said the word accountable, which I think a lot of people might, uh, you know, uh, that might make them feel a little uncomfortable at times. Do you uh, rule with an iron fist or, or are you a little bit different? How does that work for you? What do you, what have you found successful in your, in your time? 
You know what I find? So there isn't a one size fits all, right? For, for whether, you know, or for any organization or for every person in the organization, right? You have to have some flexibility um, to, to drive, you know, the change that you need to drive. Um, so, so yes, sometimes it's an iron fist and sometimes no, because it's not necessary because when you have the right people in the right place, they will drive that change, right? right. Um, but, but in terms of, um, you know, how, how easy it is to do that kind of thing, I, I think it's just really that people, nobody likes to, you know, be the one who puts up their, their slide and says, you know, I missed every single one of my goals. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to do that, right? I don't care what your goals are in life, what your aspirations are, who wants to be the one to say, I missed every single one of my goals. So, you know, having that, the kind of rigor where you have to present the results that you achieved is one thing, right? Um, and then, you know, even if you are that person who misses them, you know, you sort of see other people making their goals and you kind of want to, you know, make your goals, right? If for, if, if, if for no other reason, right, right. right? And there could be reasons why you miss your goals. You know, the, you know, companies, you know, change, right? Things happen, higher to priorities change. Um, so, so the way I think about that is I, I just don't want surprises. Right. I mean, we can have a goal of achieving X, um, but something else may come along. We think it's a higher priority. It's something that allows it, you know, would cause us to miss that goal. But we agree up front, we're going to go for that opportunity because that makes sense for the company. And we know we're going to miss our the goal that we previously stated. OK, fine. Then we're not surprised. We made that conscious decision. The key thing is not being surprised. And if you're managing managing these metrics and goals all along, then you shouldn't be surprised. You might not like the answer, right? It might, right. might not be exactly what you want, but you shouldn't be surprised. And so that's the way I, I, I manage my team. Definitely don't want to report a surprise. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. All right, so I got a couple of questions for you. So we're gonna go a little bit off here. So uh, I hope you're ready. Um, <laughs> So this one is from uh, Kate Swalstead, uh, and she is asking, how do you deal with discouragement when trying to uh, trying new challenging things that don't succeed? It's a very good question, actually. Yeah. Well, you know, that, I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, literature out there that says the way that you grow is by failing, right? Um, not succeeding. So none of us are going to be able to do everything we want to do in a perfect way. Um, none of us have, right? And not a single one of us have, and not a single one of us will, will be able to do that. So I think it's just really trying to learn from our mistakes, whether they're small mistakes or big mistakes. Um, what can you learn from that to move forward? Um, so, so, and, you know, I'm, I'm probably un not, not unlike a lot of you out there who probably are, 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 we are hardest on ourselves, right? When we kind of mess up, we beat ourselves over the head. But um, I think what I try to do and I would encourage others to do is to, you know, say, okay, what, what could we have done better? Next time, uh, let's, you know, because it's a shame to make a mistake and not learn from it, right? <laughs> it's a real shame. Because, you know, you might make the same mistake again. So I think it's really ask yourself, what, what can I learn from it to make myself better or to better ourselves uh, in the future? And then uh, really take that to heart so that you apply it next time, um, I think is the best way to, to think about that. I always tell my kids, and I know it's not about me right now, but I always tell my kids that you have to fall down in order to get up. Yeah. So, and I think that there's some truth to that. Okay, so our next question here is from Pam Pachetti. I hope I said that right. Um, and it's as, she's asking, uh, as a new CFO, are there key organizations you'd recommend joining? So I think if you mean like key companies, uh, key organizations is probably well, or... She might, she might be, you can, Pam, you can clarify, but it, it, I, I believe what she means is like maybe an FEI or something. Oh, right? okay. Yeah, I, I could be wrong, but that, I believe that's what she's asking. I think those are very helpful. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, real, yes, I see what she says, or yes, FEI, or I, I think these organizations can add, definitely add value because they're networking opportunities for you to meet other people and other people to meet you. Um, and you can share ideas. Um, I'm on several different CFO roundtables, and those are really helpful because we talk about what's top of mind and we share ideas, um, and it becomes a resource um, for each of us. So I think those are that's those are great ideas. 
Um, one of the things I, I recall from Jack's conversation was uh, he he's very involved in boards. Are how do, what are your thoughts on that? Are you involved in any right now, or how do you how do you what are your thoughts for a new CFO? Yeah, I think so. So up to this point, I I, I am actively looking at at joining a board now. Um, but I would say up to this point, I was not really because I felt, you know, becoming a new CFO, I really needed to focus my energies and, and, and time on, on making sure that I could, you know, get my organization, you know, um, shored up, solidified, uh, establish a strategy and all of that. And that takes a lot of time. So I didn't want to have, you know, um, I, I wanted to really focus my energy on that. Um, but, you know, although there's still a lot more to do at Lattice, that, that will certainly take up a lot of my energy, but I feel like I've got a really sound foundation in terms of the great team that I have um, and, and the strategy and focus. So, so now I feel I'm at a, at a place that I can take on that additional responsibility. But, but, you know, I think it's a matter, you just sort of have to know yourself and how much time you've got. Um, and if you've got the bandwidth, then great. But if you if, if it's a new job, often you need to spend a little bit more time on that job to get yourself up to speed. And it might be better to wait a, a little bit of time after that. But I think in general, for a CFO to be on a board, I mean, everyone I've talked to, including uh, Jack, you know, Jack, when he was a, an active CFO, you know, he was also on boards. And I think it does really help. Uh, you see the other side, right? I mean, as, as a CFO, you're participating with your own audit committee. Uh, and on your own board, but being on the other side of it, I think just helps make you a better CFO, which is which is why I'm interested in, in, in joining a board as well. Great. Um, okay, so this is this is a great question from uh, Dylan Shaw. I hope I said that right, Dylan. I apologize if I didn't. Um, and I hope my boss isn't hearing me answer or ask this question right now. Uh, how do you stay motivated to improve yourself and your company? I mean. Yeah, there are days where I come home and I'm just like, I just want to go to bed for a week. Um, it, it, and I'm not a publicly traded company. How, how does that work for you? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm just, I, I'm, I'm motivated that I, I, I see, I, when I see opportunities at the company, I, I want to pursue those and, and, and you know, get, get them to conclusion. I think I feed off my team and I hope my team feeds off me as well where I'm excited and motivated uh, to, to improve um, things and that they are also excited and motivated to improve. So I think, you know, you kind of feed off each other. I think, you know, the executive team, you know, Jim Anderson, you know, is, is, is a great, uh, you know, great leader, very motivated. I think the other members of our, our leadership team are, are also very motivated and excited. And I think you feed off each other. So I think that helps if you were the only one who's motivated um, and, and, and trying to do that heavy lift, that, that, that's challenging. Um, I'm sure it's not impossible, uh, but it's certainly challenging. It's made easier because I, we have so many uh, who, uh, you know, on the team who are, who are motivated and excited. But I think also once you see some, you know, you start to see some improvement, that's pretty exciting. Like, okay, it, it actually works. All right, let's do more. Right. Um, and, you know, the investors are excited when they see an improvement um, and, and they want more too. They're constantly saying, oh, well, you know, how come it's only this much? How come not more? Um, so all those things kind of, you know, come into play and, you know, not everything works, right? It goes back to the same thing. I mean, you can't, you know, you're not always going to succeed at every single thing you try, but that's why you have a lot of things, you know, a lot of uh, uh, items in your toolbox to be able to activate to, to, to drive improvement. Um, so, yeah. Well, and I was going to say, I mean, that's actually a great, great, I keep on saying segue, but great segue to kind of another question, which is, you know, we talked about kind of how you got to this double digit growth in, I mean, one of the ways was that you completely, you completely reanalyzed the way that your products were, were, were being done and, you know, yeah, did it make sense yeah. to continue doing that? I think that would be something kind of interesting to talk about because I mean, that's a, you, you're a big company to be able to just say, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. You know, so I, talk about that for a second. I think that's yeah. really interesting. So, so um, when uh, when the new CEO, when Jim started and, and the leadership team and all of us started, I mean, one of one of the projects that was undertaken was to go ahead and uh, look at all of the uh, R and D projects. I mean, but I mean, this company 
it, it's R and D spend. Actually, it's SGNA spend was almost as almost as high as its R and D spend. So SGNA was was a key area of focus too. But from an R and D perspective, though, we did go ahead and look at the art projects that were being worked on to rationalize them because. You know, I mean, engineers just by their very nature, they they want to develop new things, right? Um, come up with new ways of doing things. But but it's really finances' role to to make sure that they're really the projects that are going to add the most ROI, um, and really establish that kind of rigor to look at look and see does it make sense um, to work on these projects. And so there were a lot of science projects, frankly, that were being worked out on that we just canceled, um, and and really focused the team. Uh, on the core FPGA business. And I think that that actually motivated the R&D team more because they weren't, you know, what wasn't just just sort of fractured way of looking things. It was very focused, very clear the direction. Um, and that's what, you know, that that's what we continued uh, to focus the team on. So it was really, you know, I think if anybody's, you know, well, you don't even have to be starting your, your job at a new company, right? You can be at a company and start, just start questioning things. Is, does it make sense just because, you know, things have always been done a certain way um, does it mean that that's the right way for the company? So, you know, um, really looking at what's adding value. Um, and, and in this case, it was looking at those R&D projects and, and the ROI that they contributed and, and really streamlining it, that, that it had a big impact. Cool. Um, so I have a question here from Jalpa uh, Shah. Sorry, I know I just butchered your name. I apologize. Um, but the question is, how easy was it to set goals and was it taken positively? I mean, probably a good good way to talk about this last yeah. too, right? That's a really good question because, you know, you can come in and say, okay, these are the goals, you know, go off and achieve them, right? right. <laughs> Doesn't quite work that way. Um, what I found is that um, my, my team was actually excited to put together a plan for the goals because they weren't asked to do that before. Um, and so to really uh, take ownership um, for the plan uh, of how they thought they could achieve the goals and a timeline. And, you know, when we, when we reviewed it, if we thought the timeline was too long, we poked on that and said, well, wh why is it going to take X quarters to get this improvement? You know, what can we do to pull it in? Right. So we poked on it and asked those types of questions. But the, you know, it, the members of my team, I mean, they took ownership and uh, I empowered them to put together a plan as to how they were going to achieve those goals. And so they were actually motivated and energized to do that. Um, because I think where, um, you know, if, if, if you, if you don't have direction, like the worst thing, I think, I think everybody wants to be told at some level what to do, right? What, what, what goal am I working toward right now? I can disagree. You can, Chris, you can give me a goal and I can say, I don't think that makes any sense. And these are the reasons why right. but hopefully that's a, that's a, a productive conversation and out the outcome of that will be a goal that we both think makes reason, you know, is a reasonable goal, right? Um, versus not putting any goal out there. And when, you know, you're just moving along and whatever happens, happens, the financials will are what they are. And, you know, it, it can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. But I think it's um, that empowerment uh, of the team um, that really motivated them to come up with their plans um, they were excited to share their plans and we talked about them and evaluated and, you know, pulled in, pushed out whatever we needed to do. So that was it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying that, that was a good, that was a, a good part of it. Okay. So when you guys kind of switched things around um, with management and everything, um, I mean, you might've answered this already, but how how did how did finance and accounting really get involved in those decisions because it kind of leads me to this other question about kpis and kpi reporting but i mean you guys did a lot of analysis and what have you but i mean how how truly does finance and accounting get involved in in some of these some of these decisions i think the first First and foremost, there has to be a culture at the company that finance always has a seat at the table. That's very important because um, if you just have to rely on uh, folks in, in various aspects of the business to reach out to finance, they may or may not, right? And, and then finance is not involved, right? That's not a good way to have it. So um, my, my team uh, participates in the staff meetings of you know, all, all of the, you know, the functional executive leaders um, so that they can add that value. 
Um, and, you know, whether it's an easy example of an ROI, right, for the R&D team, that's an easy example. But if you don't know what the R&D projects are, then it's hard to calculate an ROI, you know, I mean, so they need to be at the table and know what's being discussed, um, what strategies are being discussed so that they can add value. Um, so I think that that's the first thing they have to be at the table. Obviously, you need to have the right people in the right seat to be able to add that value. Um, I've, I've got, got a great uh, fp &A team. Um, you know, really strong, um, really, uh, um, you know, in the way that they think about things, um, asking questions um, very strategically. And I think all the functions are just pulling on them for additional help, which is a good thing to have, right? When you, when you always have, when I always see my FP&A team being, um, you know, included in other, uh, you know, my, my uh, peers, uh, you know, whether it's operations or whether it's R&D or sales, always being included in those staff meetings and those projects, that's exactly what you want to have. Um, and then they will, um, you know, they, they see the value that you provide that the FP&A, in my case, it's FP&A, it could be a, another finance person or whatever, but in my case, it's FP&A. Um, and and that, that makes the difference. Cool. Um... Let's uh, let's just chat real quick about kind of the future for you guys. I mean, obviously you're you're rolling down the the, the hill really at a, at a rapid clip, and there's a lot of good momentum going. What are you most excited about with respect to the company and uh, for the future, and and how do you play a part in that? Yeah, I, I think we're we as I mentioned, we just had our investor day a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was virtual. I mean, two years ago, it was at NASDAQ. So it was, you know, right there on Times Square. It's really exciting. But um, so unfortunately, because of COVID, we, we couldn't be doing it in person at NASDAQ. But we were still excited uh, because, I'm, as I mentioned, we raised our long-term targets. Um, and we also announced a new product portfolio uh, platform called the Avant platform. So um, that was very exciting. But, but what am I most excited about going forward? It's really generating that sustainable double-digit revenue growth. Um, we, we put that out as a target um, that in the near term, um, it'll be uh, low double digits fueled by our Nexus portfolio, which is a, a product uh, launch that we announced at the end of last year. Um, and then fueled by, you know, accelerated really by our Avant uh, platform, the new platform that we announced. So it's that double digit sustainable revenue growth that I'm excited about and the value that, that uh, my team can, can uh, play to, to really help support that. Um, because when you when you look at the company and you think about companies, you know, company growing at that pace, um, you know, you, you need to make sure that you have the right systems in place. You need to make sure that you um, can, can scale for that kind of growth. And it's not necessarily always, OK, just add headcount, just add headcount. Right. I've got key key um, initiatives with my team for automation. Um, you know, using bots for automation. There's lots of lots of projects that we're looking at. We, we implemented Adaptive. I'll give a shout out to Armanino for helping us implement that tool. <laughs> Thank you, that's <laughs> wonderful. Tool, which my, my FP&A team is, is thrilled about um, that, that's adding value. So, so you need to think about doing things differently so that you can increase the bandwidth of, a, you know, of, of my team and um, to support that double digit growth. So. I think that's exciting. I think it's exciting that as we grow, it'll create more opportunities for folks on my team just to, to gain more exposure in different areas. I think, you know, continuing to develop people is really exciting. Um, and I think that creates that opportunity as well. So lots, lots of fun things ahead. Okay. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, and it's probably more of a personal one, um, but and you're sitting there going, great. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I've, I've so much enjoyed getting to, to know you and I just have found you fascinating and just kind of what you've done and everything. And the thing that strikes me most about you is that you were just so well grounded. I mean, you do not you, you do not exude this kind of larger than life kind of uh, mentality. You are you are who you are, and I mean, you just you seem to be very uh, normal. Uh, dare I say? Um, how do you how do you go about you know having such a stressful job, doing the things that you do with your job, and then you know still maintain this kind of normal person 
kind of uh, personality. I, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm asking a really good question or not, but this is more for my benefit. <laughs> Well, I mean, thank thank you for that. Um, I think that it's probably, you know, a, a lot of the fact is that, you know, we're not, there's a lot more work at Lattice, we're not done. Um, so, you know, we can check the box on a, on a lot of the goals that we put out in 2019, but, you know, we raised the bar, right? So, so we're saying, okay, how, you know, how can we do more, get more to the bottom line, increase our gross margins, still reduce our SGNA, you know, all those types of things. And we have plans in place for all of that, but you know, it's, we, we, it's, it's continuing to execute on those plans. So, so we're not done um, by that stretch. There's still lots of, lots of work to do there. Um, and I, and I think the fact that I've, you know, I've, I've got a great team that I rely upon. I don't have all the answers, right? I mean, no, no one person has all the answers. And so I, I rely very heavily on my team uh, to give their viewpoints and to share their perspective on on you know different things as we as we look at those, um, and I think it's just that continue you know continuous uh, improvement. I mean, I think I told you this. I mean, we were chatting before the the call that I have the, you know I'm going to do the Stanford Executive MBA program uh, this summer, um, which 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 I was supposed to do two years ago, but it just didn't happen then. And then COVID hit, and I know you're you're doing your your Harvard one too. <laughs> But um, you know it's continuous development, right? And it's um, because it's it's the thinking. You know, I'm you, you never know enough. You can never do enough. I guess that's the way I, I kind of think about it. Um, it's it's continuous improvement, and that's um, you know when you know you got a lot to do, um, you're not at the top of the hill looking down. I'm still here. Looking, <laughs> I gotta, I still gotta climb up more. If there's more to do. Every not day. That's humbling. <laughs> Every day. All right. Well, we got we got two minutes left, so um, I guess what I would just kind of want to leave with is number one, um, you know, if people on the call are interested in connecting up with you, should I give them your home phone number or what? <laughs> you can. How about LinkedIn is probably the best way. <laughs> LinkedIn is better. Okay, uh, so LinkedIn, um, and then. Uh, you know, first of all, I want to thank, you know, Savannah and Debbie for helping me out on, on my side for getting this all ready. So I appreciate you guys, appreciate the attendees. Um, and, and most of all, Sherry, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, but I do have two minutes left for one question. Um, <laughs> what was your most unfavorite thing about the salad bar? The Thousand Island salad dressing <laughs> spread all over the place that I had to clean up. <laughs> that was exactly the reaction I wanted to elicit. <laughs> salad dressing. Okay, I, I yeah. will remember that. I'm I will remember that. Yucky, huh? <laughs> um, do you have any any advice that you want to just pass on to everybody uh, before you b before we part ways here? Do you have anything that might just be helpful for everyone to think about? Yeah, I think it 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 it's it really is true that you know if you set your your mind that you want you want to be do something uh, be in a certain role you can definitely do it right just set your mind to it and seek out those people who are already in that role and ask uh, for advice from them don't hesitate to do that because I think people are very happy to give their perspective um, and I I definitely uh, encourage you to do that. Um, always ask questions um, in your job because that always be curious and ask questions and always ask for exposure to other areas to develop you. Even if it doesn't mean a promotion, just get that exposure. It helps develop you more. I think all of those things, they've been very helpful to me at least. And, and I hope that helps others out there too. Awesome. Well, Sherry Luther, CFO of Lattice Semiconductors. Thank you so much for making the time for us today. And uh, I really, really enjoyed it. So I get, I get to, I hope I get to talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. All right, likewise. Thank you so Thank much. You.